Okay, so yes, welcome. Um, we are talking this afternoon about developing compliant transition plans. Um, we're going to dive right in. So we're going to start with the introductions. This is our team. My name is Carly Thibodeau. I am a member of the supervision and monitoring team. And I joined the team just over a year ago. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. And with me today is Ashley. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Satry. I'm the newest member of the supervision and monitoring team. And um, before joining the department in July, I was a special ed teacher in Maine and Virginia for 14 years, and uh, compliant transition plans are an area of growth for me. So I'll be here learning with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and also with us today is Julie Pelletier. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I'm the admin support for the monitoring team, and I've been with the DOE for just over, just about six and a half years. And before that, I was admin support at a K-5 elementary school for about 16 years. Awesome. Thank you. And Colette Sullivan is our federal programs coordinator. Um, and Jennifer Gleason is another special ed consultant on the team. They are just busy doing other things today. So um, this is the best way to get in touch with us. Our contact information, if you ever have questions or need any kind of support, that is what we are here for. We do our best to get back to you within a day or two. Um, Okay, our agenda today, well, we just did quick introductions. Um, we're going to go over getting started with uh, transition plans and talk about what is the B13 indicator and then go through some specific training around those components that we look at um, during the monitoring process. Uh, we will go through a quick case study and talk about the checklist and any facts and questions that or just a display of some facts and questions and uh, resources at the end. So here is a link to the procedural manual. This is a huge resource. If you don't have it yet, I highly recommend having it accessible either electronically on your desktop or have a printed copy um, to reference because it is very helpful. It goes through all of the special ed forms, um, gives instructions, directions, examples, and it's a huge, huge help. Uh, the Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations, or MUSER, this is a link to those, and they are anything you need to know about special ed law, you can find it here. It is not as user-friendly as the procedural manual, so it is a little bit harder to navigate. Um, just to start, uh, MUSER is being updated. Um, and it goes into effect tomorrow because there has been that change in ending special ed eligibility um, for students up to age 22. Previously, it was up to age 20, but LD98 was passed, and it is now, the uh, law has been updated to age 22. And this link will work to take you to that law if you would like to take a look at it. Okay, so what is B13? That was what I asked when I started this position on this team because we throw this around like everybody knows what it is, but not everyone does know what it is. So basically B13 is one of the federal indicators. The B stands for part B. Um, and then the 13 is this indicator that we are required to report out on is number 13 in the list of those indicators from the federal DOE. Uh, so just a little more information. Those indicators are measures of compliance, um, and it does relate or has uh, to do with IDEA. And B13 specifically looks at the percent of students ages 16 and older. Um, MUSER outlines ninth grade, but IDEA is for 16 or older. Um, and making sure that they have those um, compliant transition plans in place. So this is important to us because the state of Maine is required to report all of these B or all of the B13 data that we gather um, from the SAUs across the state. And so we have to report that to OSEP, the Office of Special Ed Programs, which is the federal DOE, basically. And so this means 
that we look at several pieces of the transition plan. And so if any one of those pieces is non-compliant, then we have to report the whole plan as 0%. So it's a zero or 100% is how we um, report that to OSEP. So even just having one piece out of compliance means we have to report that as zero. So we really look at each transition plan to make sure that each of those pieces meets the federal requirements. Okay, and a lot of this training will be focused mainly on the compliance piece. However, there's also programming to think about, right? Because that really is very important, almost more important than the compliance, but the compliance is what we are required to report. But we know how important that programming piece is. So just remembering that promoting those ambitious outcomes for youths, that's super important when you're thinking about developing and working with the students to develop their transition plan, because it really should be student-centered planning for these transition plans. And two members of the bigger Department of Education team are Titus O'Rourke and Leora Byrus. And they are kind of our experts on tran anything transition. So whenever we get questions about transition beyond compliance, we always refer people to Titus and Leora because they have excellent knowledge and an abundance of knowledge around this topic. So they are our eligibility to 22 contact people. And we do have, this is their email here, but later on, we do also have a link to like the transition website, um, which they kind of keep track of. So we will share that as we get going. Okay, so part of that programming piece, um, just to talk about that is meaningful day. And so here meaningful day means individualized access for persons with developmental disabilities to support their participation in activities and functions of community life that are desired and chosen by the general population. So really this is about making sure that when you're working with your students to develop those transition plans, it's really about thinking about a meaningful day for them, about them being active community members, um, you know, helping them to design those goals that support purposeful transition. And I know when I've listened to Titus talk about this before, that word purposeful is used, she uses it again and again, because it really is about having that purposeful work and having purposeful engagement within the community for those students. And it's really not about the day being meaningful, like a meaningful day to us. It's what is a meaningful day for that student and really getting down to what is meaningful for them because all people and their families have the right to have um, life within their community and have those you know aspirations and be involved and be part of their community um, and then just thinking about what is it to me to have a meaningful life some things to think about when you're thinking about how to live a meaningful life and maybe you could talk about these things with your student as you're doing that more student-centered planning, but we're gonna ask you to kind of think about that right now. So um, just if you wouldn't mind, tell us something in the chat box, something that makes life meaningful to you. Um, right, I definitely would start with my children, my family, absolutely. Yes, we have some pet parents out there. I too have pets along with my children. Yep, absolutely. Keeping an eye on those goals, very much so. And I apologize, usually at the beginning I say this, but I'll just plug it in now. Um, we definitely use the chat box as a means of communication, but also feel free to come off of mute um, and ask questions or you know interject as, as it's appropriate just as using the chat box. So excellent. Thank you all for participating in that. So everybody deserves the opportunity to live a life that is meaningful to them, including our students as we start 
helping them transition um, to that post-secondary life. And so these are some of those big picture guiding questions um, around what you might wanna talk about with the student and the things that you can use as you're helping support developing that transition plan. And so what is it that you're actually doing to support the student? What are those assessments that you're using? And how are you using those assessments like uh, or applying those results rather? So once you've given the assessment, it's not just there so you can stick it on the transition plan and say, oh, I've given them an assessment. It's really taking those assessment results and applying them to helping that student figure out what they want to do and what how they want to set up their goals for their transition plan. Um, making sure, talking to them about those activities and services and making sure that they're meaningful on their transition plan. And also, what are you doing to help that student achieve their post-secondary goals um, and reach that expectation of a meaningful day, you know, um, really helping them become purposeful and meaningful to the student. So just to keep that in mind, because the rest of this training is really geared toward more towards compliance and the pieces that we look at. But we all know that as teachers, you are working with your students in a, in a more meaningful way. And so just keeping these things in mind. All right, any questions so far? And I apologize if I sound like I, because I have to be honest, when I was a special ed teacher, I never wrote a transition plan. So when I came to the team, this was one of my new learning experiences. So everything I know is what I've learned from being in this position. Um, Carly, there's one question just about the abbreviated day for older students whose meaningful day might not be the entire school day, if we're gonna address that. Um, I do not think that we address that in this training. I don't think it comes up, but we did address it um, when we did the abbreviated day training. And so because there are a lot of questions around students that only come in for like part of their day or something like that, is that an abbreviated day? And our question will always be, is that something that's available to all students? So if you have those students that are in general education and they're only coming in for part of their day because that's appropriate and they only need those many credits and they have like senior privileges, so they come in and get the credits that they need and the classes they need, and then they leave, if that's appropriate and it's available to all students and then it would also be appropriate and available to your special education students. And so if you are having a different kind of day for those students and it's available to everyone, then that would not be counted as an abbreviated day. Okay. We are going to get into the specific B13 components um, that we look at and that are on the transition plan. So the first thing is when you go to section three of the IEP, you have that, like we call it the table of contents kind of thing. And so you just have the yes, no checks, right? And so that J um, asks if the child's in ninth grade or above or 16 years or older, then yes, then that section nine of the IEP would be completed. So if you have a student that has a transition plan and they meet this criteria, then you should be checking yes in section three. Oh, look, there's one there, okay. And then this is just what the section nine of the IEP looks like. This is the transition plan. It's just one page when um, nothing's filled in on it. So again, just alluding to, I kind of talked about this, but IDEA says that this section must be complete um, during but not later than the year that the student turns 16. However, Muser um, kind of went above and beyond that and said no later than ninth grade or the age of 16, whichever comes first. So this is just a note that when you're doing post-secondary planning, these are for students with disabilities beginning during their ninth grade year here in Maine or when they turn 16, whichever comes first. 
And um, however, it is possible. And I know that some SAUs actually start transition planning earlier than this. And um, I know that other team members have said, you know, I really wish when I worked with like my functional life skills students that I had started talking about post-secondary and done some transition planning activities even earlier before that high school time, um, just to kind of get them on the path of what they want to do after school. So, and writing these transition plans is really about showing movement. So these transition plans must show movement. Um, and that would be why they are required to be updated annually so that you can see uh, what the student and you know you all have planned for the student together at the beginning of their transition planning and then how it changes over time and shows that movement of change. So here's that checklist of the B13 components and where they are looked at either in the advanced written notice, the um, parental consent form, the written notice, or parts of the IEP. And we're going to go into each of these in detail. Okay, so well, the first thing we're going to talk about, or first things, are making sure that we have the purpose of the meeting and the child invited to the meeting. And we look at both of these things in the advanced written notice to make sure that they are there. So the first thing is that purpose of the meeting. So in order to meet compliance for purpose of the meeting, the advanced written notice just needs to have this box checked off on the advanced written notice, post-secondary goals and transition services. So I know that a lot of directors will tell their teachers, especially high school teachers, Anytime you meet on a student, when you do the advanced written notice or whoever's doing the advanced written notice, always check this box for every single meeting. That way you're covered for compliance. Then the student being invited to the meeting or the child invited to the meeting. So best practice is that you include them in the salutation of the advanced written notice here, like this example here where it says, dear Mr. and Mrs. Doe and Johnny. So including the student right there, but we have had feedback that sometimes people that are using vendors don't allow them to change this salutation. Um, so if that's the case, at least make sure that they are on the second page of the advanced written notice where it says like child or student um, and make sure that their name is there as an invited person. Okay, okay, now we're moving on to this next one. And this is a bit of a change in practice. So this is pretty important right now because we're going to be looking at things a little differently for this agency invited with parents prior written consent. So this has to do with IEP, the 9G on the IEP and the parental consent form. It's a lot of, okay. So first of all, 9G is the bottom of the transition plan. But if you have decided, and I pulled this screenshot out of the procedural manual, I know it's really small, but if you go to page 41, you can see it much better. But if the SAU determines that an outside agency services are necessary, then you are going to list them in 9G. If someone is listed in 9G, if an agency is listed here, the SAU must, the SAU must invite that outside agency. And to do that, you would use this parental consent to invite other agencies to IEP meetings because you have to get parental consent to invite the outside agencies. So again, if you list someone in 9G, and that's if the SAU determines that someone is necessary to be listed there. If not, you can just say that they don't have anyone or leave it blank or put NA. Um, but if someone is listed here as an outside agency that must be invited, the SAU must invite them. And so you need to use this parental consent to invite other agencies form. And it's page 47 in the procedural manual. 
And I believe it's on our website if you need to print a copy of it to fill out. So this is taken right from IDEA and MUSER, where it says to the extent appropriate with the consent of the parents or the child who has reached age of majority in implementing the requirements of see above, the public agency must invite a representative of any participating agency that is likely to be responsible for, for providing or paying for transition services. So that's who you would list in 9G if there is someone. If there isn't, you don't have to put anybody in 9G. But if you do, then you, the SAU, is responsible. They, you must invite the representative. And you're going to document the parent consent using this form. So these dates, date given mailed to the parent, that will be important, and date received back with their signature. And if they don't um, give consent, that's how you're going to document that using this form. So you're using this form to document the parent consent or lack of consent, because it's either going to be signed from uh, signed by them and given back, or you're going to show that you mailed it asking for consent but it never came back. And then in the written notice of the meeting, you would talk about how it wasn't, you know, they weren't, get, they did not give consent. So this is a kind of a big change in practice um, or change in guidance from us, I should say. Oh, thank you. Ashley just dropped the consent form um, in the chat. So you can have a link to that. So, Okay, and this consent is needed prior to the advance written notice. So you have to, that's a lot of pre-planning. So you know that you're going to be sending out the advance written notice. You know that you have a outside provider that you need to invite. You have to send that consent form, get their permission before you even send that advance written notice. And it has to be done for every meeting where transition planning is discussed. So it's not just a one and done like some of the other forms. <clears throat> now, the parents, of course, can invite whoever they want to an IEP meeting. So if they decide that they want to invite an outside agency, clearly document that in the written notice. Um, however, if you have somebody listed in 9G, that should have those, that agency should have been invited by you. So that is a must. Um, so that consent form should be in there if they're listed in 9G. But if the parents come and they've brought an outside agency representative, just document that in the written notice by saying they were invited by the parents. Okay. Any questions about that? Because that's a little bit of a change before I move on to the next thing. Okay. If it something comes up, you know how to get in touch with us or interrupt me. It's okay. Okay, next we're moving on to the post-secondary goals being updated annually, and we look in the written notice for this. So in your written notice, again, you just want to make sure you check off that post-secondary goals and transition services on the written notice this time. And then somewhere in the written notice, this says section five, but you can put it in any section. It doesn't matter which section to us, as long as you have a statement in your written notice somewhere that says something around along the lines of the team reviewed and updated transition goals. Something to let us know that those post-secondary goals or that transition plan has been updated by the team. Okay, uh, this is 9A of the IEP, so that very first part of the secondary transition plan. This is where you're going to put in the projected date of graduation or program completion. Now, this is a projected date, and you can, on page 37 in the procedural manual, it talks more about this, um, but you just want to put the month and the year. So when you're recording this in that section 9A, that's the anticipated graduation or departure from high school. Um, so this date can change, but the uh, and planning beyond the four years needs to begin as early as possible. So if you think that there is a student that will be staying um, beyond the four years, 
then you would want to start that planning as soon as you can. And then just document that discussion on the written notice. Next part of the transition plan that we look at are those post-secondary goals based on age-appropriate assessments. And we look at 9B of the IEP for this. Okay, that's a lot of buttons. Okay, so in 9B, it asks for a list of transition assessments that were completed. And so you can list those assessments that were appropriate and given to your student. Um, and we just give guidance to put the year that they were completed next to the assessment. And it's good to keep that list um, as the years go on, you know, keep the 2021, add the 2023, that kind of thing. So you can show that movement with the transition planning and the assessments that were given from year to year. Here are some examples of acceptable transition assessments and then assessments without transition components. So these should not be listed in 9B, but then the acceptable, acceptable ones are on the left, such as the SATs or PSATs and those other ones. Um, oh, your transition assessments must be listed in 9B. They can also be included in section 4A of the IEP where you're putting your most recent evaluations of the student. Um, because again, this shows that movement toward your post-secondary goals. So adding them to section four is uh, optional, but recommended. So here's an example. If you decided to put them in section 4A, you can see that they have their uh, eligibility evaluations listed, and then they've added that in January of 2023, they've done a career interest inventory and an informal student interview and just gave some information from that assessment. And then this is something that we're working on. Um, we're hoping to have a list of assessments on our website. It, it isn't up currently, but we are working on this. We do have some links here within the PowerPoint and just some ideas. Like I said, the previous B13 training was very much around a lot of transition assessments and things. So we've used some of those links, but um, this is more about the compliance piece. So here's one, the quick book of transition assessments. All right, section uh, 9C of the IEP. This is where you put whether the child attended um, or if they didn't attend the meeting then getting document those efforts made to get their input around their post-secondary interests. So either they attended or just documenting that you they didn't attend, but you had a conversation with them and talked about their post-secondary plan and the date that you did that. All right. Next, we're going to be talking about those post-secondary goals in education training, employment, and independent living. And that is, we look at those in 9D, but we also look in section five of the IEP at annual goals, because there is a requirement to have one annual goal in section five aligned to um, the post-secondary goals. So here in 9D, the education training goal, this is where you put, um, and you write these as child will statements. So the child will and what they, what their goal is for education and training. And then after a conversation with them, what is their goal for employment? You know, after high school, this post-secondary. So these should be connected or related. So you're going to be using these two things because their education training really should help them um, with that employment. Okay. Next is independent living skill, this goal. This is um, optional, as it says, when appropriate. So depending on the student, this may be blank, but it is good to consider this and just uh, consider some of these possible goals when speaking with the student. It may be one of these things that they need to work on for post-secondary. 
Okay, so here are some examples of how those goals might look in the IEP. We have an education training goal. This student will attend a four-year college or university to study marketing. Um, and then the employment goal, the student will work in the field of marketing. So you can see how the education training goal really uh, leads into that employment goal. And then this student does have an independent living goal. So the student will live independently and will access mental health supports in his community with support from his parents. <clears throat> oh, so this is, what if the child wants to be a professional video gamer? Okay, and again, I did not write transition goals. However, I have heard, you know, my colleagues talk about kind of this topic. And it's really about um, giving them the opportunity to explore that career. So if they want to be a video gamer, you know, it's really important to work with them to look into all of the aspects of that job of being a video gamer. You know, how long would you have to go to school after high school? Like, would you have to go to school? What would you have to do to do that? Explore like the whole field of that um of that career that they want to do that may not be well within their range of being able to do. Um, but, you know, don't discourage them from wanting to pursue that career or um, that type of employment, but really work with them to try to figure out, okay, is that really what I want to do? Or is there something else along those lines that would be more appropriate? And if at all possible, I know things are starting to get a little bit better with being able to get back out in the community and visit places and do some of that job shadowing. Um, but, you know, maybe giving them, getting them out and job shadowing people that are doing jobs related to that video gamer um, career that they want to, that they're interested in. Um, and then just maybe some of those additional jobs like the game tester or designer. I know uh, from the previous training, uh, one of my colleagues, Leora Byra, she talks about a student that she had that wanted to be a veterinarian. However, after um, researching that and realizing how long she'd have to go to school and all that thing, the student kind of came to her own decision that maybe she didn't want to be a veterinarian, but they looked into other avenues kind of involving pets or things like that. And so I think ultimately she thought maybe, oh, maybe a dog groomer might be a better idea. So um, just kind of, you know, helping them navigate how to get to something that is more appropriate for them. Okay. And as I alluded to before, there must be alignment to at least one annual goal that addresses the post-secondary goals. So Recently, we've seen um, some transition goals in Section 5, but they really just don't work out. They, they're they kind of awkward and they don't fit into a skill deficit, which you would need to be aligned to the goal. So um, we give guidance um, that you attach it to an existing goal. So we'll go through what that might look like. So just an idea that you may have an academic or functional goal that's appropriate for education, employment, or independent living. So you might have three annual goals that are attached, that are um, linked or aligned to your post-secondary, or you may just have one annual goal in Section 5 that links to all of those post-secondary goals. So here's an example of there was this academic goal already on the student's IEP that given specially designed instruction and writing, this student would write informative essays to examine complex concepts through organized analysis of content with 90% accuracy. So in order to align that to the post-secondary goals, they just added this phrase, in preparation for a career in marketing, because that was what the student outlined on their post-secondary goal as what they wanted to do for their employment. So the annual academic goal was already here. They just used that phrase and inserted it to into the annual goal to make it align to the post-secondary goals. Here's another one. This functional goal was already in place. This was around given social work services. Um, this student will work on managing their anxiety by using techniques learned during social work sessions. 
And so in order to align that goal, which would be appropriate to help this student prepare for attending a four-year college or university, that education goal, they just put in this phrase, in preparation for attending a four-year college or university to study marketing. So this was an appropriate annual goal that was already there that could align right to that education um, training goal. Carly? This yes. Is a lot. Can you go back and just explain um, a couple slides where you were talking about, I'm confused on aligning it to one goal. Can you go back and talk about that? This one? Yes. Okay, yeah. So basically, if your student has three goals, or I mean, if your student has like 10 goals, right, and you find one academic goal, and you're like, oh, that aligns to his education training, because he says he wants to go to school for marketing, and this math goal would really align to his wanting to go to school for marketing. Okay, you okay. could put that sentence in there, or that phrase, add that phrase in there. Yep. Or if you had another academic goal, and it was around um, reading, uh, you yep. know, uh, reading comprehension. Oh, this would really help him when he's employed as in the marketing field. He has to be able to read and comprehend, you know, the work that he gets. So you could add that phrase in there. Then maybe he has a functional goal around that anxiety piece. Yeah. And so you could put that in there about him being uh, that in preparation for, you know, living independently or however that worked out. Um, that goal would be aligned to that independent living goal. Okay, but so you do, you, do, yeah. I'm sorry, do you need one goal for educational training, one goal for employment, one goal for independent living? No, it's all. No, and that's what the or is. So okay. you could just take that one goal because that one goal for, for example, the anxiety, right? The, yeah. That anxiety would cover the education because he needs to be able to manage his anxiety to go to school, to get into the field of marketing. He needs okay. to manage his anxiety when he's employed in the marketing field. And he also needs to manage his anxiety if he's out living on his own. So you can okay. find one goal that relates to all of those instead of choosing three, one for one. You know? But you have to have a goal that that meets every single... Sorry. Well, I'm... No, that's okay. Really, it's about the education, training, and employment. Because not okay. every student will have the independent living. But okay. you definitely need to have one annual goal that aligns to that education employment. And really, they should, one goal should align to both because the education training is already aligned to the employment. So if you align an annual goal to one of those, it's really to both. Okay. Thank does you. That, does that clarify it? I think so, yes. Right. And it does not matter if it's an academic goal or a functional goal. Okay. It just has to be one goal, either academic or functional. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So now we're moving on to the course of study, and that is in the IEP in section 9E of the transition plan. So when we look at this section on the transition plan, we are looking for a multi-year um, list of specific classes that the student is planning on taking. So for example, this student, this could have been, this could be the student's ninth grade year. And so they're saying this year, I wanna take English, algebra and so on. And they're taking art, PE, Spanish. And then they probably have identified in their post-secondary goals that they wanna do something with business or marketing, because you can see that in 11th and 12th grade, they're going to do some introduction to business and some independent study. And that is going to be around intro to marketing. So whatever your courses are, when you get into those electives, you don't want to say electives. You really want to document those courses that are available to them that would support their post-secondary goals. So you do want to try to be specific in this list. Um, and this is listed by ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. And if you have students that are going beyond the four years, you can just do like a 12 plus. You don't have to, you know, do a grade. Um, you could uh, label them by years instead of by grade. Uh, or you could just do like first year, second year, third year, something like that. 
if you want to take out the ninth grade, tenth grade, so on. Um, but there should be a plan from when they enter high school to when they exit high school. Um, and that's going to change. So right now, this kiddo wants to, he's interested in marketing. So right now in 11th and 12th grade, he has those classes. But if in 10th grade, he comes in or the next year he comes in, he says, no, I don't want to do marketing anymore. I want to be a mechanic. Then you can adjust those 11th grade and 12th grade electives and change them to match his interests and put them into something around that mechanics, whatever that may be offered in your SAU. And I may have just said everything that's on this slide. So, yeah. So you want to have uh, identify their post-secondary, yeah, multi-year through end of high school. Um, we do give guidance to leave the previous years on. So like if you have a ninth grader and now they're in 11th grade, you can just leave 10 and 9 on there just to kind of show that movement again. I know some people do take them off, but we we do give the guidance to leave them on and just make adjustments as you go. Okay. All right. Man, I feel like we're cruising right through this. Okay. So next is uh, our, our transition services. These are not child will statements. And this is in the IEP in section 9F. So in 9F, you're going to be listing the, let's see, it actually said, describe the activities provided by the adults in the school and in the community that will enable and promote the child's progress toward meeting annual and post-secondary goals. So this is why we say no child will statements, because these are the activities provided by the adults in the school and in the community. So when you're filling out this section, we highly recommend a bulleted list. Just bullet out what those education and related services are, what those career employment and other post-secondary adult living objectives are, those community experiences, and again, if appropriate, the daily living skills. So that is the only one that might be blank, but there should be at least one activity in each section for education, career, and community. Um, and again, it's the adults providing the service. So there's no child will statement here. So it's not child will register to vote. It's just that he will just bullet register to vote because the adult is going to be providing assistance and support and, you know, working with them to get them registered to vote. Oh, look at that. I said that too. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So transition services and activities, these are services that occur during the life of the IEP. They're provided by the adults in the school or community. Um, and they're able to show movement when previous years are left on subsequent IEPs. So just like the, the courses of study and how I said, we really recommend leaving the previous years of courses of study, same with these transition services. Um, even if they've already done them, leave them there. That just shows that movement that these are the activities that the student has, has received. Um, and then again, these are not child will statements and they should not include future services or activities. So these are current ones or previous ones. Okay. Good to know. All right. The last part of the IEP, and this is part of that, uh, well, it's not really part of the transition plan because transition plan is section nine, but section 10 is that age of majority, but this would go along with these students in this at this age level. Um, so when the student <clears throat> is uh, informed of their transfer of rights at the age of majority, when they turn or turning 18, then you just wanna indicate here the date that the student and the parents were informed of that transfer of rights. And this should be done at or before the IEP meeting for the year the student will turn 17. And this date does not change on this section of the IEP because once you inform 
the or indicate the date that they're informed of their rights, then that would be the date that they were informed. So that should not change. Okay. Okay. And just some takeaways from this, you know, those transition plans really should be student centered. Um, getting the family involved is very important. Having them involved with the student, those assessments, um, remember, use those assessments, um, use the data from those to really uh, develop the transition plan and help the student develop their transition plan. Um, the student must be invited. That is one of the things that we look for, as I talked about at the beginning, as part of that advanced written notice. Um, and then those outside agencies that you are listing in 9G, if you list someone in 9G as an agency who's involved in their post-secondary transition planning, they must be part of the IEP team and you must invite them using that and making sure to get that consent. Okay. Oh, and here is the link to, we have uh, professional development. This is our professional learning page. If you follow this link to our professional learning page, there is a specific spot around transition planning. Um, it includes like the Tuesday power hour with Titus. It has her trainings on there as well as some of our trainings like the B13. And in the spring, we did one around the summary of performance form. So those are all located here. Um, and this, this is that link that I said that would be here later. This goes to the transition page where you can find out all information that you need to know about transition. And if you can't, Titus and Leora's contact information, well, Titus's is, I don't think Leora's is, but we have their information in this slide. So you can reach out to one of them if you have questions specific to transition outside of compliance. Uh, oh, good. And Ashley dropped that link in the chat as well. Thank you, Ashley. So any questions as we kind of wrap up our B13 training? Okay. Right, the professional learning page, awesome. Okay, so this is the checklist. Um, we have that B13 checklist. This is, we went through each of these components and these are the things that we specifically look at when we come on site and look at transition plans when we visit districts. Um, and this is what we are required to report back to OSEP. Now, this is a, it, this is from NSTTAC. So it's something to do with, N, well, it's not NTACT, but it's similar. But this is a group and they have a great checklist if you go to this website and it's a user-friendly we got some great information from this checklist to help us kind of get things in alignment um, that can help with making sure that your transition plans are complete and have all the components necessary okay so we're going to go through this case study of bill now remember i have never written a transition plan so um, if you have questions please feel free to ask questions because I will do my best to answer them. Um, but we're gonna look at Bill. And Bill is 19 years old and he gets specially designed instruction with an alternate curriculum in a self-contained self setting all day. Uh, he receives related services, OTPT, speech and language and nursing. He's fed via a G-tube and he has a tracheotomy and uses a ventilator with oxygen to breathe. So we often get questions about those really, you know, complicated students. And it sounds like Bill is a complicated student. So when you're thinking about writing Bill's uh, transition plan, you want to involve him as much as possible. And so after meeting with Bill and getting as much input as he can give, um, the goal, education goal for Bill is that after completing high school, Bill will, will participate in an in-home or center-based program designed to provide habilitative and vocational training with medical and therapeutic supports. Bill will participate in on-the-job training and using micro switches. So even though Bill is a bit complicated, he still has that education training goal. 
designed around what he is able to do in his interests. So that leads us to his employment goal. And so it says that after completing high school, Bill will participate in technology supported or volunteer workplace with supported job development services through vocational rehab rehabilitation, which everybody knows is voc rehab, right? So you can see that he is right. So he's going to participate in on the job training using micro switches. So that was his education and he's getting those training medical sports. So this is um, related to his education training and the previous goal. Then he does have an independent living goal that after completing high school, Bill will leave, leave, just live at home and participate to the maximum extent possible in his daily routines, feeding, dressing, bathing, et cetera, and environment using technology. So really thinking about Bill and his needs and going forward and his need for that independent living goal. So this is his section 9D in a snapshot with his education, employment, and independent living goal, how they would look in 9D. And I'm not going to read through them again because they're the same thing. But you can see that he's got all of those. Then, remember, we need to have one annual goal in the IEP that's aligned. And so this actually goes all the way back to section 4B with his strengths. And so this is where they're talking about Bill's strengths on the IEP. He is curious, stays alert and awake throughout the school day, enjoys getting verbal and tactile attention from peers and staff. He tolerates his position changes and so on. And you can see here that he likes using a switch with assistance to activate a variety of devices, including a radio and computer. So we know that that was a strength for him. So that makes sense that that was aligned to his transition goals. Um, and here are his functional skill gaps because you take into account the student's strengths and also their needs, right? And so functionally, he has some communication needs, expressive and receptive. Uh, he has that communication device. And then he has those limited fine motor skills. And so there should be a goal. Yep, here's that goal that's aligned to one of those gaps in section 4D where he is using his communication device. So he's using it to communicate that single word or communicate single words with 20% accuracy. So they've written a goal for speech and language that he will independently and accurately use his device to communicate yes, to indicate a desire for an item. And he's going to do that with 50% accuracy. So in order to align this to his post-secondary goals, they just added that statement of in preparation for education, employment, and independent living. So he's doing, he's working on this, guilt, oh, this goal of using his communication device to communicate yes, and it's in preparation for the all of those goals outlined on his transition plan. Okay. And then these are those frequently asked questions. Um, I am not going to go through each one, but you, if you ask for a contact hour um, from today's training, you will get a copy of the PowerPoint. And we did drop them in earlier in the training. So if you were able to access that link, you should have them. But I'm just going to kind of go through these and you can read these uh, on your own time. As, you, as they come up, you can look for these. So I'm just going to kind of click through. There's not too, too many. And then any last questions before we really wrap things up? Okay, so we do have some resources available for you. Um, this first slide is our, our our resources. The first one is our professional development calendar where you can go on and sign up for any of our PD upcoming. Then you have the second one, 
That's the one that Ashley dropped in the chat where you can find the transition um, PowerPoints and recordings, and you can find a bunch of other ones from us as well. And then you have those other ones with all of the special ed resources, forms, laws, and regulations. Yes, we can do that. I'm going to go back up here and grab this, and copy it, and then drop it in. I dropped it one more time for, oh my goodness gracious, I'm so sorry. I got a little carried away. I was in the wrong. There we go. Phew. Okay. Now this is, again, Titus and Leora's contact information. They are our experts on eligibility to 22. So if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to them. Um, and then just some other resources when it comes to transition. Uh, websites that you can visit. I think a lot of these have assessments that would be available to you um, and ways to help your students, you know, figure out what they want to do and help guide them through setting up their uh, transition plan. So we've got the Wisconsin suite of self-advocacy resources. Okay, here's Oh, and I think this is where that checklist came from that I showed you earlier that we have used. We've got that writing and compliant transition plan. And then just an overview of transition planning. So a few more resources for you. And then this is our professional development schedule for the 23-24 year. Some have already passed, but we have some upcoming. Um, the links are live in the uh, copies of the PowerPoint. So feel free to click on those and register for any of these trainings. Most of them are from three to 4 p.m. and they don't always go the full hour, um, but the ones that are during the day are like these, these ones, like the B13 or the full IEP trainings. We do ask that you, you know, if you have a chance and you're willing, please share these PD opportunities with your gen ed teachers. We've got a training coming up tomorrow on discipline and manifestation determination. It would be great if they had knowledge about that. Um, along with special ed law for gen ed teachers, that was, we got some feedback that that would be a great topic for PD. So we have added that this year. We also ask, we always encourage related service providers to join our PD. However, some that may be a little more pertinent to their work are writing measurable functional goals and avoiding outcomes and consultation related service goals. So you can see that's in February and May. And this is the link to our feedback. Um, whoops, and you can also, can't spell apparently. Um, so you can use the link, you can use the QR code from your mobile device. Um, we always ask for feedback because we're trying to make the professional development um, appropriate for your needs. So we highly encourage people to give us that feedback. And then today's training is just, I think it's B13 training. Um, when it's when you're asked to select the training you attended, and if you'd like a contact hour certificate for today, you just enter your email address and we will also send copies of the PowerPoint to you. And Julie will upload this training as soon as she gets it all edited and good to go on the website. You can also reach out to her if you would like a copy sent directly to you. Um, let's see, and this is our contact information. One more time, just in case you want to get in touch with us. Uh, again, we are here to support you. So please reach out if you need anything from us, have any questions. And that's Julie's specific information. Um, if you would like a copy of that training. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. All right. So any final questions, comments, anything you want to share before we end the training for today? Yes, you're welcome. Thank you all for joining us. This is like I said, it's been the Carly, Ashley, and Julie show today. So we appreciate you if you were with us in the morning and you came back for more this afternoon because 
<laughs> that says a lot about what great people you are. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Enjoy what's left of the day. Have a great one.